Welcome everybody to uh, the Spiritual Origins of Conspiracy with Lisa Romero. My name is Tess Parker. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs for the Anthroposophical Society. We're so glad you're here joining us today. Uh, throughout the event, we will have um, to limit distractions and to keep um, a sort of sacred space. We'll have a, the chat will be turned off. The question, you can direct any questions to the hosts, myself, Laura, or Sarah. Um, and yeah, well, everyone will be muted throughout the meeting as well. So, um, yeah, I have a candle here and I'm going to light it so we can begin. And then I'll pass it over to Laura. Okay, it's great to see you all and welcome to the Spiritual Origins of Conspiracy. Thank you for opening the space for us, Tess. Uh, we're so lucky to have Lisa Romero here with us today and um, assisting her and working with her so closely is Sarah Mecca. Thank you for being here, Sarah, and uh, helping bring this program uh, into fruition today. So I'm really excited to introduce you, Lisa. Um, we've been together, you're one of the faculty members for Applied Anthroposophy, our year-long course. Um, and I want to say that I got this book of yours um, in New Orleans, I think, uh, when you spoke at one of our conferences, The Inner Work Path. Um, we're going to put a link up to all your books, but it's been very influential for me um, in my spiritual life. And so I'll tell you all a little bit about Lisa uh, before we get started. Um, and that is that obviously you're an author of many inner development uh, work books and um, courses and complementary health practitioner. And uh, you've been um, working with Inner Work Path um, and everyone will get a link to that site um, and Educare Do, and we're going to send out some more information about all these amazing educational opportunities that you offer to people. Uh, and you've gone between uh, Australia and Ireland and the US, um, bringing this work to uh, young people through the Y Project, and also through developing the self, developing the world, which is what I hope we're all doing here together today. Um, I want to let people know about some of your upcoming um, offerings, and there's a special code that everyone here will be able to attend uh, one of these, I think, for free, Lisa, right? So we're going to put that, we're going to put that slide up now and uh, share some of that, that new work that's happening uh, that we're really excited about. Thank you, Lisa, so much for taking on this big, big topic um, and these other big topics that everybody sees right here on the screen about nature spirits and elementals. Um, and we'll make sure we share this information with everybody that's here too. So um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Lisa. Thank you so much and um, looking forward to it. Okay. I, I believe I've, I need to mic up. Is that sounding better? Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, um, hmm. Sorry, I'm just getting myself together. Well, I, you know, thank you all for giving your time to this question in a way and to come clean with how I've come to working with this picture is that I am um, I didn't actually start with any question about conspiracy I was actually through my work with the festivals and the ongoing exploration I've had with the elemental world and the etheric realm I was really asking this question how is it with everything that Rudolf Steiner said that not more people are having an experience of the etheric Christ in this time? It's been a strong question for me because there's such an important connection to this evolving time and the crisis in the way we find ourselves in that 
you know, we were given lots of pictures in various ways from Rudasana that from the 20th century onwards, not just individuals, but even groups of people would have this experience of the Christ in the etheric. And so it was actually really out of penetrating this question that I came across something of what Steiner calls the great conspiracy. And the great conspiracy, as many of you would have read or heard about, is the conspiracy that the spiritual world doesn't exist. And this is a, a conspiracy that has actually a lot of momentum. And in that sense, we can begin to sort of start this journey of understanding conspiracy and its origins. But to do so, I want to really talk about some of these influences that are coming in against or with this great conspiracy as it's been named. Today is the Chinese New Year. So for those of you that are celebrating that, it's a wonderful festival. And it's got a lot of interesting aspects to this festival. Now there's sort of the way that you live before the Chinese New Year can actually have an influence on how the future of the year will go. These are pictures that people live with. You know, you don't clean your house on the Chinese New Year. You don't even wash for some people. And this aspect of this particular festival um, is something that, you know, if we're not culturally connected to it, we may not know anything about those details. But many festivals have actually lost their substance and their real esoteric um, nourishment because we are unable to engage with them in the way that we used to. So let's just take the pictures of, you know, the, the various festivals that arise. And, and, and many of them have a component that is often not spoken about and that is a component of fasting. Uh, so next Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, will be the beginning of Lent. And for some people, it will include 40, 40, perhaps 46 days of intermittent fasting. And then we've passed Ramadan, where we've, we see also this uh, relationship to fasting that happens intermittently so no no eating but any substance between uh, dawn and dusk and then we have in the buddhist traditions different people would take on uh, aspects depending on where, where they're working of this relationship to fasting and in most of the traditions, or in the Jewish traditions, we see Yom Kippur, where there's a fasting day of atonement. In most of these traditions, there's a quality of purification and being able to connect more deeply to the spiritual world. Well, it comes in various ways, but these are sort of the archetypes of it um, and I think it was in was it 1963 Pope at that time John Paul VI said you don't actually have to fast it's, in, it's voluntary now just Ash Wednesday and Good Friday so there was also the 40 days of Advent fasting and this has been going on in humanity fasting before vision quests, fasting before certain initiation rites. We see it biblically from Moses to Daniel to Jesus. All these places where we experience this part of the human being taking 
taking part in something that unites them to the spiritual world as a cycle in the course of the year or prepares them before one of the great festivals. But we have now this, uh, and uh, one of the reasons I wanted to speak about it is because we can see actually something that's happened just recently since, in fact, it's really the last 10 years where there's been a lot of scientific study on the effects of fasting. And we've gone from, you know, from Harvard to the New England Journal of Medicine to all of these very well-renowned um, schools have actually looked into the nature of fasting and its effect on the human being. I'm sure a lot of you know that half of Silicon Valley are doing intermittent fasting at the moment. It's all over the place because the science reveals that when you actually do intermittent fasting, they follow the blood work and they can actually see this change that takes place within the systems. And it's quite, quite extraordinary, really. We see these changes in terms of blood sugar levels. We see the metabolic improvement of the whole metabolism improves. We see changes in inflammation in the system. And so this science, and it goes right through to improvements into the uh, genetic expression, gene expression, uh, the hormonal system, uh, growth hormone is improved, all the levels are improved of insulin. And so this science with the data is, is bringing this thing, which has been going on for thousands of years for the human being, now very separated from anything to do with spirituality and given it in this structure, which actually just looks at the imprint on the physiology. And in a certain way, we see something in this picture that is part of this continual influence that we're experiencing is that the scientific world in many respects can really observe and is observing in more and more detail the imprint the footprint of the human being in the soil of the earth it's able to pull this apart and in its detail We've become very convinced in these words like the data. Just going to wait for the data. We're going to have a look at the data and see what the data says. Just need to look at the research. But what it's doing for the human being, actually, is that it is bringing in a way of thinking about us that is very deeply dissatisfying to the soul. At the same time, a lot of people can't find much satisfaction in the religious fasting. I give up this, give up that, don't get on your Facebook for 40 days or whatever it is that people are doing. But somehow there is also no kind of deep fulfillment in that, except for it perhaps has just been passed on to us to do it through um, because it was done in our family, you know, we all had pancakes on the Tuesday and then didn't eat much on the Wednesday. But what does it really mean? There's not much meaning or depth in it. And so we, we kind of live in with this influence that's coming in. And what's so interesting about that science is it has jumped to a conclusion. And the conclusion says, the reason why this works is because we, you know, when we were hunters and gatherers, this is a conclusion. It should really be a hypothesis, but it's a conclusion that we, we, we're, we're able to, um, we're used to this kind of fasting. There's no 
mention of the fact that for thousands of years, humanity has actually been working with fasting. It's completely ignored. Now, spiritual science always like always approaches the facts of life from a much greater point of view. So on one hand, the science can be interesting and relevant because it shows us something of the health giving processes be, uh, behind what we're doing. But the science can't say what we're doing. It just says this is, this is the footprint that's made. But when we look at it from a spiritual scientific point of view, we can ask actually what takes, what actually takes place? I am getting to conspiracy, but this is quite a useful ground to lay. What actually takes place when the human being goes on a fast? And this is something that, you know, on one hand, we could spend a week talking about the processes that go on just to get the grounding of the understanding from anthroposophy of the human being so we can really, really feel the blossoming of the pictures that take place with the human being in relationship to this change of the astral body's connection to the world around it. So our astral body, this body of desire, wishes and cravings that we all know about so strongly, is subjugated in the fast. It actually doesn't have, through the act of fasting, it actually doesn't get the same sort of ability to just do its thing, it's held back. And on one hand, because the astral body is held back, there's this, this change that happens where the physical forces can begin to penetrate the astral body. This very wise body that we have, the physical body, oldest part of us, actually can bring up in a way this wisdom <clears throat> into the astral body because of this act of holding back this part of us that just runs unconsciously most of the time. And that's only one aspect of fasting. The other aspect of fasting is really interesting. And that is when the astral body is held back from this kind of patterning that it does, where it is just running its desires and its wishes and its wants all over the world, as we do, and trying to gratify ourselves, the self gratification is one of its great, great desires. When all of that's held back, it changes what is taken in through our daily consciousness. And then when we sleep at night, the astral body hasn't got to go through the same level of digesting the attachments to the sensory world because it has already been sort of held at check from all of its gripping, grasping, wanting, desiring. And in that relationship, it's more smoothly goes through the process that we often think about as our dreaming life, where it's a, a very strong digestion and all the imprints and all the things that came in through the day get moved and shifted through us. And we can enter into this realm of deep sleep in a slightly more clarified way. And in deep sleep, here is the place where the astral body goes through what is called a rhythmatization. Its rhythms get Im imbued again <clears throat> with these very deep cosmic pictures, these universal pictures that actually belong to the cosmic being that we are. And in fact, if we can reach deep sleep, whether we fast or don't fast, the deep sleep is what actually renews us. We remember who we are and why we're here. And of course, we come back into our bodily vehicle in the morning and we enter into what we start to call the anaesthetizing world. We forget. But in that 
time of this cosmic experience, we are able to draw closer if we are not so engaged in and fettered with the desire body that is attached to the earthly world. So fasting in the sense of what is given from the religious picture brings us closer to God. Maybe we won't call it that in the spiritual scientific sense, but we would say it actually supports the pathway of where this rhythmatization can occur, where the actual astral body is imbued and echoed with the spiritual activity that we are deeply united with. And in that, and this is really an interesting picture, the astral body actually imprints that back into the etheric and physical body, bringing health to the system. I might ask Sarah to pop up a few of our planetary pictures. I know some of you would have seen these, but just as a visual, a look at the relationship of Venus first to the Earth. So in eight orbits of the Earth, this is the pattern, a beautiful rhythm. You see the five pointed or the rose Venus as they sometimes call it. And we might look up <coughs> at the pattern of um, Mars. You'll get these in the recording so you can actually look at them again yourself and perhaps that will be useful for some of you. And the pattern of Mercury. and the pattern of Jupiter. It's, it's pretty profound. This is this rhythmic relationship that actually the planets do as they orbit coming into relationship to the Earth. We'll take it down now, thanks, Sarah. So, of course, we've moved from a geocentric to a he heliocentric version of the world. But actually, when you look at the planets to the geocentric version, there's still so much to be revealed in that, to be revealed in that experience. Now, for some people, spiritual science gives us something. Now, I've just touched on this tiny little aspect that spiritual science can say about fasting. But actually, when we enter into it and break it open, we could think and talk about it for a long period of time because it's not, it's not closed down. It actually opens up our relationship to a much wider understanding. <clears throat> it also allows us to actually begin to penetrate things like why certain spiritual practices really focus on the desire body. And that to, to try to, des not to <laughs> as Buddha said, to desire one, only one thing to de be desireless. How important it is to actually look at how this astral body works into the world around us? What is it gripping and clinging and attaching itself to? Because as it does that, it gives itself a weight that needs to be lifted in the etheric realm before we can enter into the deep sleep consciousness. So in this realm of dreaming of picture consciousness, we are actually, by the way that we live our day, giving ourselves a greater burden in our connection to the spiritual world at night. And so much of the exercises that are given in meditation, and many of you know, it's not just the exercise that's important, it's how it's given in the rhythm because the rhythm of the exercise that it's done at a certain point of day that you bring out of your own self, this rhythm in your connection to the spiritual world, this rhythmization 
making rhythmic this relationship between the human being's earthly life and its relationship to this to the spiritual world and we used to all do that in festivals but there are different rhythms we have the rhythm of the ego that's working every day we have the rhythm of the astral body that's a weekly rhythm and most traditions have something that goes on on a weekly rhythm as well then we have the rhythm of the etheric body a monthly rhythm and then the yearly rhythm and these extraordinary rhythms that actually allow us to go into this deep relationship to the cosmic being that we are and to actually bring that relationship into our earth, earthly life. But we're losing those rhythms and those rhythms are being lost to other kinds of rhythms. You notice the rhythm of technology always remember the crossing the the road in new york city whoever moved what what part of my being moves to that rhythm it is all of these things that constantly penetrate our outer world that we actually get thrown into a disharmony a disharmony between ourselves and the universe and ourselves and the, the world around us. And thank the spiritual world for sleep. Now we all may know that as we develop in ourselves, there is this thing called a continuation of consciousness where actually the sleep isn't quite the same sleep, but we wouldn't wanna do that unless we've able to bring into our everyday life true spiritual rhythm out of ourselves so what is it that makes us so vulnerable to this disharmony is actually what lives in this astral body all the wishes the desires and the cravings a great vulnerability and most things in the world is in a sense prey or tempt this vulnerability all the time prey upon it and what the individual human being isn't really that aware of is actually the effects it has on your own health and well-being so fasting from a spiritual point of view has a has a as I mentioned, is, that's just a drop in the ocean of understanding of what it is. And there are, in a way, three different kinds of food. You have the religious picture, which actually doesn't have much to tell us. There's simple pictures, purification, get closer to God, purification or com commemoration of particular events, but it doesn't give us this wealth of our relationship as a cosmic being and then we have the scientific picture that actually dismisses the cosmic being and there is all there's no hypothesis that includes the spiritual being at all and it is these pictures that are growing with greater and greater intensity the spiritual pictures are actually diminishing people are finding it hard to actually grasp their meaning because their meaning is so loaded with some other kind of conditioning but actually it's really essential for this great conspiracy to not take hold that we keep maintaining this relationship to the spiritual world But conspiracy itself is not acting in the, in the realm of the astral body in the same way as wishes, desires and cravings and addiction and all of these things do. Conspiracy actually is working much more dynamically in the realm of what we call the etheric body. 
I know some of you are new trans philosophy online, so I'm just going to have to go for it. And we can think about those thoughts later. Because these process is really important for us to understand if we do if we don't get don't want to be taken down by the very thing that is creating this great conspiracy so within the etheric body deception lies and conspiracy have the greatest form of disorder in So whenever we experience deception, lies and conspiracy, and I'm not saying someone that believes in conspiracy is in that realm. It's those that are enacting a conspiracy to deceive, to lie and to conspire to do harm in any shape or form to the progress of humanity. It actually creates a imbalance in the realm of the etheric and what it does to the etheric body is it creates a sclerotic hardening fixing and for those of you that are very well versed in anthropology you know quite clearly that how etheric body affects our capacity to think your agility in your thinking requires a flexibility of your etheric body. Your ability to actually um, take hold of this conceptual life in its complex, multiple dimensional way of understanding actually requires a flexible etheric life. But if we want to block that, in the human being, you want to create a rigidity in the etheric. Now, this is actually quite useful because one of the things about cons people that actually become aware of conspiracy can get trapped by the very thing they're trying to reveal as an error. We see it in all different ways and shapes and forms. Like somebody that may be outraged at the barbaric way in which we treat the animal world. They are so outraged that they treat the human world in this barbaric way because of how they treat the animal world. And from the point of view of the damage that does spiritually, it's same process has got a hold of us. So anytime we enter into the rabbit hole of trying to understand something, we also have to be aware of who's behind it because it's likely to be the very thing that you struggle face to face with. And that's not an easy thing to confront that actually by following particular theories I'm decreasing my fluidity of thinking it may not be the case for everybody but it is a trap that is set within anything that we try to re release ourselves from so we are if we, we could say that lies, deception, conspiracy is to the etheric body, which these wishes, cravings are to the astral body. And they both have this desire to actually take humanity away from this whole relationship to the spiritual world. Even though sometimes it comes under the guise of bringing us into a closer relationship to the spiritual world because we believe that we may be fighting for the spirit
so it seems to be that there's some really incredibly positive things happening for humanity at the moment. Things that actually reveal that we are waking up to certain aspects of our being that we weren't necessarily waking up to in the past. Because even though we might not get it on a really conscious level, many people are experiencing around the world that something's not right. Something is just not right. We don't know what it is necessarily. But there is this common picture and we are looking for the answers of what's not right. But the archetypal what's not right links us to this great conspiracy, which is that when we sleep every night, we come into relationship to the cosmic human being. When we wake every morning, we come into relationship to the earthly human being. But when we look around at the world that we've created and the social forms that we've created, the systems we've created, the way of being and doing and thinking and believing, there's an incredible disparity between the cosmic self and this earthly self. And that seems to be getting wider. And that is causing a lot of people in their way to feel that actually where we're headed is, is, not, is not quite right. Something has to change. Something's got to give. This can't be the path we're going on. However, we're also getting tripped up by particular types of science. And this is tricky in this age because, you know, we, I believe in the science. It's almost becoming a new religion. A religion that actually isn't including who we really are as a human being. A religion devoid of spirit, but actually I hear hordes of young people saying, I believe in science. What science you believe in? You believe in the data? That's not, even for the scientists, that's not science. The pure scientists. And they will tell you that consensus science takes a long period of time. And we can certainly say in spiritual science, the process, which is this heart of science, is actually worth working with, the process of science. But the results and how it perceives the human being is diminishing us. So how do we actually work with the process which is really important, but not actually get fixed upon this idea. And particularly when consensus science is being rushed or when there is actually not the willingness to stay in a relationship to the question or in a way to deceive humanity because we couldn't handle the truth, perhaps, whatever it is. this but it's not really important I mean I know this may sound strange but we have to ask ourselves what really matters and you could say well what matters to me and what matters to you is a very different thing but I don't mean it in that common term of what's personal to me I mean what will matter what will come into manifestation 
at the end of the day, what really matters is that we do not lose to the great conspiracy that the spiritual being does not exist, the spiritual world does not exist. And if the spiritual world does not exist, then what's taking place in you can literally be shown by algorithms, whether it be love that you're experiencing or profound experiences of revelation. Because we can't bring the spirit into the forms that are permissible in the natural sciences as they stand today. Spiritual science, however, works in a very different way with the human being. And it's actually through the methodology of spiritual science that we protect the etheric body from the lies, the deception and the conspiracy. And the methodology of spiritual science actually is something that is a little bit of hard work. It's much easier just to believe something that we're told. So I'm going to give you four methods that Steiner spoke about in esoteric development. And it, so we can just look at this recognition of the relationship to science and spiritual science. The first is no unproven concepts should enter my soul. Now that's, that's quite an ask. I remember when I came across this at the age of 20, I was like, what the, how the, how, what, what's this? Now, this is very important because just in that one statement, no unproven concept should enter my soul. I have recognized something that happens is that before the thought penetrates my being and becomes something that I feel and act on, I must evaluate it. I must prove it actually not to some data, but to the content of my own inner understanding. Otherwise, what you're carrying within you is someone else's content. Now, of course, most of us, we can say that I'm full of concepts that I didn't actually prove. And we can't necessarily throw them all out or even perceive them because some of them were installed in us when we were, we were young. But to do the work, to know that, to know that is actually a very useful beginning of making sure that you keep your etheric body flexible. Now, when the etheric body is inflexible, this actually blocks a whole other level of our experiencing of the spiritual world. But at the moment, we're not completely fixed, but deceptions and lies and conspiracies, if we just drink them in and let them become a part of our interior world, will have a scleroticizing effect on our etheric body. This again affects us when we go out to sleep at night. This will actually affect what can be brought back from this cosmic connection with the cosmic being and what can be re-imprinted so that those thoughts might continue to raise up in us as we keep working with the world around us. If we have an inflexible etheric body, then the spiritual world cannot penetrate into my thinking processes. And in that sense, we can understand why there is a big battle for the etheric going on. And there is an extraordinary need for us to determine deception, lies and conspiracy, but not by the typical way of thinking but by weighing it and evaluating it against our relationship to our living inner experience 
and our knowledge of the spiritual world. So this first idea, no unproven concepts are, are to enter, not an easy thing to do, to think something before you actually allow it to penetrate, to prove it for yourself. Now, of course, if you're full of concepts already about a certain things and you have what might be like these spiritual conspiracy blinkers on where everything feeds into the same conspiracy you're, you're unfree your etheric body's already getting tied down and that is what the conspiracy is after the great conspiracy is after and that's what's so strange isn't it here we are digging up what's true what's not true but if it's done in a particular way it binds us to the very thing we're trying to overcome but the second process that Steiner gives here and these are really nice scientific pictures actually that no unproven concepts it's useful scientific work, way of working but then a living obligation to continually increase the number of concepts that i carry it's also incredibly important. If, I, if, if we're not learning something, or particularly for myself, if I'm not learning something with every talk, then there's something I'm not doing right. If I'm not increasing a dynamic of understanding, And so we have to also be aware of this, that if we, if, if we want to fix the etheric body, work on a limited amount of concepts and hold strong to them. Quite a clear way to kill the etheric or deaden it. I shouldn't say kill it, but deaden it. And in the deadened etheric, you can't imprint the cosmic being pictures back so that actually not only it affects your well-being but it actually affects the type of thinking you can engage with in the day now you would have some of you would have heard about these the next one is to recognize that knowledge true knowledge will only come when the answer the yes or no of it I can regard without any sympathy or antipathy. Now that's a tricky one, isn't it? But that's a scientific approach. If a scientist says, actually, we've got, we've got to get, we've got so much money behind this, I've got to get these results, which unfortunately is happening all the time. That's not knowledge. That's bad science or what they call unclean science and there's a lot of unclean science going on that people say oh, i believe in the science but it's it's not even clean science but how do we do that where well, we're actually prepared and starting to give that lovely example that if you really want to know for yourself if there's life after death you can't carry with you in that deep questioning a desire for one particular outcome because the sympathy or antipathy affects your ability to have the living thought that supports the living knowledge of the thing and unfortunately they are like veils that they, we place upon ourselves and so we have to keep we have to keep looking at that question if i've already decided i need to find this particular individual an angel or a devil then it's already done and dusted we can't have a true conversation with something outside of our own knowledge base and this is really important in relationship to spiritual science we can't want there to be an answer particular answer
And the fourth one, which is it requires a little explanation in this time because of the words, he says, I must overcome my aversion to the so-called abstract. Now, <laughs> the problem is, is that word abstract is used in so many ways. There is a, so much abstractness in the science that is not that kind of abstractness. Or as we recently saw this very abstract reality of the stock, was it the stock market where this particular company, those of you saw it, where GameStop went from $4 to $375, showing you that actually the shares have got nothing to do with reality. They've all got to do with this big game that goes on. So abstract, but that's not the abstract that he's talking about. He's talking about, and this is very important for us, because in this framework of thinking, we can't think in the right way to understand something from the higher world if we are only able to think in intellectual processes. It's those intellectualizing of our thought life that doesn't allow us to have many genuine spiritual experiences because we can't perceive them with the closing down that happens through our way of thinking. So to not have this expectation of the answer, but also to allow it to, to express itself in the terminology, it's not the right word, but in the activity that is true of it. And that is actually very difficult for us to do because we can really only see what we can already think. And that's not useful when it comes to this relationship to the cosmic being. We need to be able to experience realms of being and understanding that are outside the constructs that we've already created. And what happens to the human being that that etheric body is getting fixed? It, it makes it a very different journey in terms of what one receives from the spiritual world every day. And this aspect, this, um, this is really a part of the great conspiracy that we in, in, the, in the world of anthroposophy, we should be very, very aware of. But there are other conspiracies that people take hold of and give a lot of time, energy and attention to would actually diminish our relationship to the spiritual world. Because within the thought process, the spiritual world doesn't come into the picture. And so if our way of thinking can't include the, the spiritual world in it, then something in us has already been caught in the conspiracy to diminish the position of the spiritual world in our lives. And that, that's something that I think we all have to be more and more mindful of. How, what, what are we doing with our thinking? How much time, energy and attention are we giving to, to thoughts that do not matter? And how much are the thought processes that we're having actually giving us a deeper relationship to the great conspiracy. Because for the 
future, for the future of humanity, that's the most important thing that we should be asking ourselves. And spiritual science has this other way of feeding the human being. It doesn't limit us to this algorithm of chemistry and biology and everything that can be actually getting more and more diminished. Nor does it actually just say you just have to have this kind of blind faith, but rather it calls us into this rich dynamic relationship between the spiritual world and the earthly world and actually how this journey is so intertwined. So there's a, I've been doing a lot of work around our relationship to the elemental world because they are also deeply affected by our thought life. If we are unable to support the liberation of our own thinking, we also are binding a whole kingdom of beings and consciousnesses to this fixed sclerotic form of a future. It's not just affecting our own being, it actually affects the, the elemental world. So on one hand, as a spiritual, working with spiritual science, we get to keep this flexibility in our etheric body. But we also must be aware of all the trappings of lies, deception, and conspiracy. They're, they are the most harmful to the life of the etheric. And of course, the truth frees us, but it isn't a truth that I'm going to find in data. It just doesn't exist in there. It has to be something that actually liberates us in this genuine connection between humanity and the spiritual world, the cosmic being that we are, and the earthly being that we are. And when we look around ourselves and we see these extraordinary abstract ways of living, which do not include this connection, we are all feeling something's not quite right. But I don't think we should let this time go by hoping that it will all just calm down. We'll get through the pandemic, we'll get through this and it'll all just calm down and we won't feel this something's not quite right anymore. Because in reality, this has been going on for, for a while. In fact, there was this recent study, and of course, you know, studies are in themselves potentially fraught, but they showed this study of, of <clears throat> a group of people in England in the 1937, before the Second World War, and they had to write about how their life was. And they actually did a follow-up before the pandemic. And what was interesting, there were two things that were mentioned consistently in 1937, and that was peace of mind and contentment that were not mentioned at all. They were completely missing from the follow-up. Peace of mind and contentment. So we, we know this sense of something's not right has already been there before now. It's just everything is heating up. So our relationship to the etheric world, our relationship to the elemental world, actually is really our relationship to the whole Earth's atmosphere. But it's also that gateway between the earthly life and the heavenly life that we pass through every night. We're watching on one hand our astral body, and I won't suggest in fasting, I'm just giving that as an example, but watching the connection, but really 
the thought, thought life. How are we going to penetrate thinking and even support the education of thinking in the right way in a world that is just being limited to thoughts based on our oh, follow the science? I, you know, what, what has been spoken about this working with our astral body and etheric body are kind of the heart of all the inner work that goes on in anthroposophy. So we all know it's there, we can find our way to it. But there is a task in front of us. And this isn't a time to just wait until things sort of settle down. This is a time to be more vigorous in our thinking. More rhythmatized in our way of living. That we ourselves choose to have a rhythmical connection out of our full consciousness with the spiritual world. And make available our life body, our etheric body, to the impressions that we meet every night we sleep. So I know that this is, um, <clears throat> we, we kind of thought we might just open it up to questions here, as Laura's shaking her head, <clears throat> nodding her head. <laughs> Um, first, I think we'll just take a moment and um, maybe if anybody has notes or anything they need to write down, they can do that. We'll just have a moment of quiet. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's been super powerful. So you can put your questions if you have them in the chat and Tess and I will uh, work with them. Just a moment. Okay. Thank you. There are a lot of interesting questions going on. And uh, if we don't get to them, please email them to us and uh, we'll see if we can pass those along for you. So um, here's one question about that aversion to the abstract um, says, I think it's actually two questions. How do we overcome that aversion to the abstract? How do we transform that feeling of discomfort about the way things are? Yeah, the, <clears throat> I would hear that as two questions. I don't think we're meant to transform the discomfort in the sense of women. We, we, the astral body wants to be comfortable, right? The desire for comfort is one of our great desires. It's actually important that we feel this disparity. It's important that we actually recognize that in this world, as we have created the systems that are unfolded in front of us, it can't reflect the cosmic being that we are as it is. And so we therefore transform the world around us to allow that to occur, not get settled within ourselves so we don't have to worry about the world, but actually what, what, what little area do each one of us work in in which we could actually add something so that the world of which we're in is more reflective of the spiritual 
life that we know. Now, in the past, we could rely upon a religious form to do that for us, but we can't do that any longer. We can't rely on a religious form even for our festivals because they don't have the same impact unless we ourselves bring this meaning to them, unless we have prepared ourselves and actively engaged with them, they are empty forms. And so we are really called up to do the work. So that's one aspect of it. We won't get comfortable with it. And how do we get comfortable with the abstract? Well, is that the other question, the comfortable with the abstract? The abstract of the spiritual world, or I'm not saying we get comfortable with the abstract of the <laughs> the forms of which um, we've created in the world have got nothing to do with the spirit because that's where the discomfort is. But when we experience certain things in our meditation or in our inner life, let's try not to explain them away with concepts that we already know to begin with. Allow things to sit, allow things to be, hold, hold the experiences. Because the moment I try to name you, put a label upon you, anyone will know this in your meditation, it, it's gone, it's changed. Now, one of the things I think is really important for us to, to do is to come into a deeper understanding of this etheric or elemental world, which is represented in the, the atmosphere of the earth. It actually is what unites us all. But the lawfulness of the <clears throat> etheric world is different than the lawfulness of the earthly waking day consciousness. Well, you know, when you're in waking day consciousness, you can't just think something and it appear. But in the realm of dreaming, you can be in one country in one minute and another country in another minute. The time, time processes change. You can, you know, tap your alarm clock and you have this epic, phenomenally epic dream. And then you wake up, it's only been five minutes. Not possible. There's time, space, and the ways of which the dreaming world unfolds itself is actually familiarizing us with the abstract, but we immediately want to name it. You know, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? How do, we, how do we lock it down rather than actually let ourselves start to let it speak to us? Now, one of the things that the e egotism does so often is try to label everything. And in doing so, you're limit in limiting your own concepts. And so not to label these experiences that we're having. Now, you know, I've begun this picture with uh, this question of why is it that we're not seeing all of these experiences of the etheric Christ? And part of it is that we're unable to see it. It's not that it's not there. We're unable to experience it, and it's not that it's not there. And that's something that is happening to us, but it's also something that we can make an adjustment to. So this work in the realm of the spiritual scientific inner dynamic is a big support to shift in our ability to perceive beyond the usual perceptive capacities. Thank you for that great answer. Um, we have so many questions coming in. So I'm going to try my best to try to group some of them um, together. There are some people asking about specific actions about getting to deep sleep or healthy ryth rhythms in addition to the festivals. Um, yeah. So there's there's definitely this question here is what 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 can we do so we don't have that hardening happen as you're saying um, so maybe some specific things yeah um, well the archetype for us individually daily is at a specific time of day to make a connection to the spiritual world with a particular exercise. And when I say particular, it doesn't mean to say it is this exercise, 
but with one that actually you recognize supports that dynamic. And then there are other things that we do. We could do that in a, I suggest every one of those rhythms, a daily rhythm being the rhythm of the ego, a weekly rhythm, finding a way to mark the weekly rhythm spiritually, a monthly rhythm and a yearly rhythm. Now the yearly rhythm is really taking place in this wonderful relationship to the elemental world and to the seasons and to these great festivals that can mark this deep relationship between the spiritual world and the elemental world and the human world and our collective journey. But really deepening into those, otherwise we are, we're losing, we're losing that, that uh, offering. And with the shifts that are taking place in the weather and the climate and the relationship to biodiversity, we know that we're actually affecting a whole other realms of being in the loss of that. We're not the only one that loses and we're not the only one that gains when it comes to being able to make those changes. So bringing this rhythmizing, bringing this into your own life is really significant. Now, you know, when people say, well, what time of day should you meditate? It's not so much a particular time, although of course there are times where we see, for instance, at dawn and at dusk, where there's this kind of shift in the consciousness between day and night, that middle place, there's these windows. But the most important thing, it's a time that you set that you yourself can enter into at that time knowing that this one I can meet because as you do this on a regular regular basis then actually the spiritual world comes to meet you in that moment too it's a bridge that you make through that consistent engagement with rhythmatizing your own astral body in relationship to the cosmic connections not just to your own cosmic being but actually to the spiritual world itself What a beautiful tip. Thank you so much for those suggestions. Um, okay. We have some people asking, oh, geez. Okay, let me see here. Um, there's some people um, asking about more specific things as related to technology and um, the dogma of materialism and um uh, there's just there's a yeah there's i think there's like several sort of pictures around um how technology affects our astral and our etheric and how that may play into this piece around conspir conspiracy i'm not sure but i think that's what i see coming well here. i mean one of the things that we we are aware of is that within everything and i've mentioned this in other talks is elemental beings so in your screen is condensed elemental being substance is made up of elemental being substance and form but if we don't acknowledge the spiritual in the physical we leave them bound to the um being utilized in only one particular way now, I've, well, you know, I may be an eternal optimist, but I also feel that if we're able to overcome the technology that exists, I mean, Steiner said we need to develop moral technology. Well, we haven't done that, but we can actually still use it morally. But what, is, what does it mean to use it morally? And then we go into a different relationship to it. And in fact, we, we know the burdens that we meet in the world, they always seem to come a little earlier than humanity is able to cope with. But if we work with it, we actually are strengthened by it. So we're not to walk away from science. We work with it. We're not to walk away from technology. We're, we're working with it right now. But in the working with it, the possibility is that we can actually become strengthened by the overcoming of what it wants to do 
if my rhythm is not affected by this tech rhythm. So I, it's one of the things that Seamus and I, um, who Seamus is up here, who's a colleague of mine who works through the arts, but we're going to work on this year is a course in the working with technology because something takes place in the processes of the atmosphere that is still different than the screen. You know, I give this example a lot of times to those of you that have your candle in the room, you know, it's very different than seeing a candle on the screen than it is to have a candle in your living space. So there is this activity of the, what we might talk about as the matter of the form that the elemental elementals take up. But then there is this connectivity that's taking place through the etheric world that will take place with or without the screen. But we have to strengthen that. So that here I am in Ireland and there you are, a lot of you in America and some of friends in Australia and it, we're all over the world. But etheric life doesn't separate us, it unites us. The machine can separate us if we're unable to extend ourselves beyond just the very thing that we see in front of ourselves. Now, this is tricky because you feel distant. And, you know, often speakers rely on watching how things land. But for me, it's not, it's, it's actually been useful to work on the screen. Because I feel like, actually, I have to extend myself in a way that I don't normally do in day consciousness. I'm extending myself in a way that I usually only do in my night consciousness. And every night we're able to do that. So how do we do it consciously in the day? Anyway, that's something that is a, is a tricky one, but I don't think we should look at the things in front of us and think they can only take us down because that's just not, that's not how it works in the spiritual world. Thank you for that. Um, I can relate to what you're saying being on here all the time. And thank you for <laughs> all of you extending yourselves here too and for these amazing questions. I'm just gonna go back to, um, one last question and then i'd like to be able to share some of the work that you're doing coming up oh, yeah. um so let me see if i can so you said this before but i'm just going to read it again because i i feel like this is a like one of those paradoxes that you know we really have to work with so um you would say that not only this is a question from someone would you say that not only do the deceptions and lies create disorder and imbalance in the etheric, but the disorder and inflexibility of the etheric becomes what conspiracists and manipulators work with? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously, we have to learn to think deeply. We have to think well. We have to think scientifically. We have to really enter into the realm of thinking so we don't allow that. And at the same time, of course, when somebody is hooked there, it is much easier to work with that. And so, you know, when Facebook did that experiment in, I think it was, when was it, 2012, where 700,000 people approximately were actually given really negative news feed and they watched what it did to their likes and not likes but what they found out from it is that they actually get more screen time out of those people and so that has become a methodology that is being utilized by lots of organizations to increase your attention currency because your attention is data and the data is actually very valuable. What is that in the human being? And here we go back to parts of our being that we haven't yet governed, right? So 
we we live with our this desire for comfort but we're hyper vigilant also to avoid pain avoid pain now of course the science will tell you it all comes back down to when we were you know didn't want to eat the berries that were going to kill us because that's who we are back there but actually there's a lot more involved in that for from a spiritual scientific point of view and there is something important in the human being making choices between what we might think as uncomfortable and comfort and it's certainly not comfortable to do inner work and really source all of the stories that live in you that have very little to do with truth and more to do with preferences but that's the that's the part we play in this um time and i think this is very important is that the work that we do is never the work for just ourselves because the moment we move out of our physical world and into this high this collective atmosphere we land in that pictures that anyone can tap into oh, this is quite something you know sometimes i have this very strong experience that something needs to be brought in thought in by a group of people not you know one person might be the mouthpiece speaking it but there's a group of people thinking in together it lands something in the ether that we can all tap into so that's why when we have these gatherings before for instance the one come up before easter three saturdays a week before easter i call them a gathering because we prefer people if they can be there so that we can land the thought processes because they sit in the world ether and there is a lot of junk mail out there there's a lot of really junk thought processes but we can also land other thoughts but that requires us to work together and to work with great intention on our task to actually not allow the great conspiracy to take that much of a hold that the future human beings don't have a choice Lisa, thank you so much. I am so grateful for this perspective. Um, it's very uh, a way to work with what's happening. And um, I appreciate that you kind of rose above the actual things that are happening and um, asked us to do our work. So thank you so much. I'm going to um, turn it over to Sarah. Do you have a, a slide for us to show on um, this upcoming work? Lisa, it's just been amazing. Thanks, Sarah. You can share that now and we'll close. Everyone, thank you so much for your incredible questions. I'm sorry it was so hard to get to all of them. Um, I hope some of them were addressed. Please feel free to email them to me. I'll see if I can pass them along. Um, and thank you all for being here. So let's let's see that last one. Yeah, so this is um this is a different slide than before, just to mention one um, one additional opportunity, which is um, that Educare do one of the organizations um, that Lisa and I are part of that was mentioned. Um, Lisa has one of uh, five subject courses um, and that's called Inner Development for World Development. And if you go to that URL there, you can actually download the first lesson um, there to work with and it's very, yeah, it's very experiential. It's very much in the gesture of this work that was brought today um, around you know, working inwardly. There's contemplations and exercises, but also a lot of very relevant um, pictures for, yeah, for this, this work of inner development for world development. Um, so that's, that's there. And I think I'll also just, um, I'll also just share quickly again, this slide from before, because I know that was up there briefly, um, but for those who, perhaps joined a little later. Great, I was just gonna ask uh, if you could put yeah. that up. <laughs> I think, did we yeah. mention that um, we're just offering to this whole group to join us um, complimentary next week, where we're looking at the element. Is it, have you got the slide there? Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna great. put back up right now. 
Yeah, oh, so yeah. that discount code is right there um, with that top event there, Nature, Spirits, and Elementals, our task and theirs in the elemental world. So that's a week um, a week on from, from Saturday. And if you use that code there, ASA Feb. Um, if you go to the, just the homepage, there's a link right in the middle of the homepage. You can click on that and register and um, you'll have a yeah, free registration for that event. You're all uh, very warmly welcome to join us. And then the three events um, as the, the Easter preparation that Lisa was mentioning, the gatherings um, in March, um, you can also check out and you know, those along with um, other work at innerworkpath.com and also to yeah, connect Lisa through that, through that website. And there is other work coming for sure. Lisa mentioned this, this course um, that'll be a little bit later this year um, that, that Lisa and Seamus will be offering. So you can, you can definitely stay in touch via those websites as well to find out about that work. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Lisa, it's been incredible to have you with us here today. And thank you for so, so many of you being here. And so we're just gonna say goodbye now and uh, we'll uh, say goodbye. So you should be able just to unmute yourself and say goodbye quickly. Thank you. <laughs>